This is the last of my interviews with Joe McDonald, who has been fighting in Ukraine for seven months and has come to tell us all about it. So, um, hello again, Lloyd. Hello. Uh, so, Joe, um, I suppose an obvious question is, what was the s most scared you ever were? Um, there were there were lots of times I I felt scared. I mean, you, you're not that if you if you weren't scared when mortars and stuff were landing near your trench, then you'd you'd be mentally ill, mm -hmm. I imagine. But um, the 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 most scared, like really thinking I, I was I was gonna die. Mm -hmm. um, I was on a, an OP, which is an observation point in the woods. Right. Waiting, looking across the the river at the Russians, um, but you know, and and, and it, it was a it was a pretty quiet OP. This one, not a lot had happened, and uh, I was um, uh, one of my stags guard duties was mm -hmm. at, was at night, and uh, I got down there, and um, you know, it's just just going dark as I as uh, I arrive, and um, I I switched over the guy. And then I uh, started doing my shift, and uh, when it came time to turn the, the night vision goggles on, uh, they weren't working. Um, a lot of the night vision goggles we'd been sent uh, were, I suspect, the ones that the Americans had already been using for recruits to train with for like mm -hmm. quite some time. Ah. And instead of giving us nice shiny new stuff, they gave themselves new stuff and sent the old stuff to Ukraine. And recruits are quite good at breaking things. Yes, aren't they? recruits are good at breaking things. So like we quite often had some problems with the night vision, like uh, only one lens would work, or it just wouldn't turn on, or all the batteries had run out. That also happened quite a bit. Mm. And um, I'm there in the in the dark, and it was a moonless night as well, so it was really really black out in the woods like really can't really see your hand in front of your face if you put your rifle down there you can't see that there's a rifle there and um i'm there at, at night and um you know i'd i had my rifle sort of a about a, about a, a few feet away from me just leaning against the side of the trench because i've been digging this bit this position out a little bit more to improve it mm -hmm. and um suddenly there's something you know it's dark now and there's something something large and alive is moving through the woods towards me and it's stopping and then moving a bit again and and it sounded really big you know that people say as quiet as a mouse mouse in the forest at night are very noisy things and they right. can make the first time you hear mice running around you're like it sound it sounds like a whole platoon of special forces are moving through the bloody woods. Right. But this sounded much louder than that, so I knew it wasn't mice. And we, I do know that there are animals in the woods, but mm -hmm. still, it sat, and it seemed like it was coming right for me. And I, I got it into my head that this, yes, the, the Russians are here. They've, we've been told that some, there were elements like special forces and saboteur elements were on our side. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a prospect, you know, of, of someone coming to try and kill us on our OP. Mm -hmm. And this thing's moving closer, and it's moving closer. And now I didn't want to, like, make noise and go for my rifle in case whatever it was opened fire on them. But I, I always had a hand grenade with me. Mm -hmm. So I've got my hand grenade, like, in my teeth. In I, your teeth? Yeah. What, I, like in the movies? Well, I, I, it, might, it, did, it might chip a tooth or something, but it leaves your right hand free to, like, hit something with a shovel or grab your gun and open fire, you know. And plus, because we didn't... We didn't I, my helmet didn't have a mount for the night vision, so even if they were working, right. I had to, like, hold them in, okay. front of my, in front of my eyes anyway. So, so like that. And then this, this thing's getting close, and it's... It's to the point now where I really think any second that they're just who at the Russians who I think are there mm. are just going to open fire on my trench or throw a hand grenade or jump in and kill me with a bayonet me or something like that. And I was literally just about to just go tink, throw the grenade, get my rifle, give him a burst and and kill whatever it was. And then at the last second, when I'm, you know, absolutely petrified, like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, I'm about to die. There's a couple of guys right there, right in front of me in the dark. I don't know if they've got night vision or anything. They might be looking at me right now and just gloating, as it were, mm -hmm. before they extinguish my life. At the last second, there's just this big, <laughs> this big snort, you know? And I realised it was a, a deer. 
a very large Carpathian deer, which is like a red deer, mm -hmm. but uh, but Carpathian. Oh, obviously. And uh, and yeah, and it was one of them. And this is just sort of snorted and pulled the ground a little bit and trotted off. And I was uh, like, <laughs> whew. Oof, okay, I know you're not meant to smoke on guard duty at night, but I think I'm going to lie at the bottom of the <laughs> trench and smoke a few cigarettes now. <laughs> okay, okay. Probably won't tell the guys about that in the morning. <laughs> so that was that was my most uh, scary moment. Yeah, um, I thought I thought I was about to be bayoneted out of my throat cut, but it turned out to be a deer. Phew. Yeah. Okay. Um... Now, uh, when you were in the uh, the positions looking across the river at the Russians, you were there. It was it was uh, the front had sort of stagnated. Yes. Um, for quite some while, and you became a forward observation officer. Well, basically, yeah. The um, I would not like to call myself a foe compared to someone who's actually done that course in the British Army because they they know where they know lots more than I do. Okay. However. Technology is a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a a program. Um, that I'm not going to name just to be on the safe side. Fair enough. Uh, that the Ukrainians have created themselves. Mm -hmm. That's basically a uh, a Google Maps meets artillery correction uh, device, and um, they have uh, yeah. And I I had I bought a tablet and I had got the program on my tablet. So you bought it with your own money. Yeah, yeah. They, they're one of the ways that the Ukrainians... The Ukrainians pay their soldiers. When you're on the front line, you get about €3,000 a month, which is a ridiculously large amount of money in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, but the Ukrainians, for one, they want to know their soldiers, their soldiers and sadly, if their soldiers die, their families mm -hmm. are well taken care of. Because three grand, I mean, you can literally buy a little cottage in Ukraine for like one or two thousand euros. So, yeah. Um, so that's, they, they look after the soldiers. But it also means that it allows the army to source all the other things they need mm -hmm. from the private sector. Which right. is actually a very effective and sensible way of dealing with logistics. Because, you know, we need all kinds of crap all the time. Like pens, mm -hmm. notebooks, new socks. Does the army really have to think of every little thing a soldier needs or can you just, you know, get the bits and pieces that you want yourself, you know what I mean? Mm. A, a new head torch, you know, things like that. So, yeah, but uh, I had this tablet and, um, you know, I had uh, a good good set of binoculars and um, on some of our positions we had a, a, a spotting scope. Mm -hmm. um, really great things they are. And... Um, yeah, I mean, most of the time we're watching across the river and, you know, you're not seeing columns of tanks and stuff going past. You know, there's, there's, there's trees in the way. Mm -hmm. And the Russians were smart enough uh, to, to take off their uniforms and, and hide their guns around a bush when they wanted to, like, do something that they knew to be in the open. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, I did have... I did spot a couple of positions that um, were passed on to the artillery, um, and as far as I know, they were they were they were hit, but I never got to see that. But I did get to see one um, place that I I spot at five kilometres with a scope. I managed to spot uh, some sort of machinery and people mm -hmm. that were hidden in a in a. They have these like head. You call it a hedgerow, but basically it's like a, a very narrow woods right. that they have to break up all the fields there. That's a Ukrainian-Russian thing. Mm. Um, and I at five kilometres, I spotted them, and like there's there's like a, a big two three kilometre wide field, and then this narrow woods, and then several more kilometres of field. So there's no reason any bugger should be there, none. And I spotted them, and then the next morning there was a guy there again, and it's like we knew then. So we're just watching this spot. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually that got passed on to the artillery and they obviously chose to overfly it with a, 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 a good drone. Mm -hmm. And then about four in the morning, um, they blew it to hell. They absolutely destroyed that entire row. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. just one shell. So as far as I know, my observation and passing on those coordinates, that led to... Quite a few Russian deaths and quite a bit of um, artillery uh, being taken out of the equation. And so it, it was an artillery battery? It would appear so, yeah. It went damn quiet. We've been getting shelled a lot and it went really quiet. 
the next week or so. It went mm. really, really quiet. And um, yeah, that's it, it, it. After seeing dead Russians in the counteroffensive, I have to admit it. It troubles me a little bit that I'm responsible for taking a lot of lives. Mm. But I really like the fact that me and my friends and the villagers we were around were getting shelled for a while. That felt good. That felt like victory. Mm. And, you know, that's a, what, what's that, lads? What's that? It's the noise of dead Russians, that is. Nothing, you know? Mm. No shells coming our way today. So that was pretty good. And it achieved, you know, it achieved some... It, it, that, that, to me, feels like Ukraine got the money's worth out of me, right. basically, you know? And, and you got some recognition, it seems, for your efforts. Well... You, you got a medal. I am, I am a decorated soldier, yes. However, um, I think, oh, if I can, yeah, I'll show the, the camera a bit of my ID. This is my Ukrainian military ID. Uh, if you can see there, I am 0012. So I, I'm one of the originals. Uh, uh -huh. There were people who joined up before me, but most of them didn't stick around, you know? So I was one of the originals who actually stuck around for longer than six months. Right. And they pretty much decided to give all of us uh, the Ukrainian Military Service Medal. But we were kind of picked out and a bit special because uh, they decided... Boris Johnson was visiting... Uh -huh. uh, just before the Kharkiv counteroffensive, uh, Johnson was visiting uh, Kiev. Right. And he was giving uh, Zelensky some... Um, some medal, uh, a Churchill medal or something like that, apparently, oh, you know. Lord. OK. And they, they went, you know, but um, we'd been told, you four Brits, me and three other of the Brit originals, mm -hmm. are getting a medal. And you go into Kiev and it's like, really? OK, cool. And we get to meet Zelensky. Yeah, we get to meet Zelensky. And I, re I really wanted to get a photo of me shaking hands with Zelensky. I mean, tinder gold. At the end of the day, that is. Um, and and uh, at the last minute, they told us, you are meeting Zelensky, but Boris Johnson is going to be pinning the medal on you. You don't sound so enthusiastic, man. Well, we're a, we're a Labour family. <laughs> so I had to call my dad and be like, oh, Dad, I've got something really bad to tell you. He's like, you've been wounded. How bad is it? Tell me the truth. And I was like, it's worse than that, Dad. I've got to shake hands with Boris fucking Johnson and it's going to be on the BBC. I didn't want you to just see it. <laughs> I did. I thought, yeah, I just seriously thought it might give my dad a heart attack if he saw that out the window. Oh, OK, so <laughs> fair enough. Your, <laughs> so, yeah. Your, your but, son, but, you know. Duty but, as a son. But at the last minute, they cancelled the thing. But uh, Oh, dear. Yeah, you know, it was... Politicians are busy chaps, you know. Right. Way. So dodging a bullet in another sort of way. In, in a way, yeah. But they did. Uh, they did take us. Um, they did give us some special treatment. They have a, a big statue called the Statue of the Motherland in Kiev, and it's a, a woman with a. It's very Statue of Liberty kind of thing, but right. it's a woman with a sword uh -huh. and a shield. And right. She's like that. You know, holding okay. the shield very... You see, that's not how to hold a shield. No, it's that's not. Why, I say that's... this on my channel, for goodness yeah. sake, hold a shield in front yeah, of it's, you. That's not... Unless you were trying to stop an arrow hitting you in the face, that's not what you do. Or the person behind you. Nevertheless, right. that's what the statue is. And um, they have a uh, an elevator inside the statue mm -hmm. that doesn't go up and down. It goes diagonally. Ooh, up the arm. Yeah, it goes... It, so we, we went up the elevator in, in, inside the statue and... Went up and went all the way to the top, and we're on top of the up on top of the shield, and there will be a couple of a photo that you can show now. Okay, D and, there it is, probably. And um, and yeah, uh, so we, we, we you can't pay to do that. Ah, that's president's permission only. Right. So we did that. All the Ukrainians I showed that were like really impressed, and it's like, okay. is it true? Is it true about the elevator? Because that's a, that's an urban legend. Ah. Not everyone knows it's true. So it's like, yes, it is true. I've been in a diagonal elevator, and okay. I've been to the top of the statue of the motherland, and it was quite funny. They had a, a full a full colonel took us to do that, mm. and he was wearing a Snoopy the Dog T-shirt. You know, it can be quite informal, <laughs> the Ukrainians, but... Just not taking this seriously. Damn, damn fine chaps, you know, <laughs> but maybe, maybe not quite as smart as the British Army likes to keep. Ah, war. It is a grim topic, and perhaps we would do well to take our minds off it for a while and stretch out our consciousness to the entire galaxy. And my kind sponsor, Wondrium, can help us do precisely that.
Wanderham, you see, is a huge website with myriads of hours of lectures by wonderful lecturers from august institutions from around the world, telling us with such enthusiasm about all the wonderful stuff they've found. And some of the stuff they found can be found in The Theory of Everything. It's one of their courses. Uh, Twenty-four lectures, each of them half an hour, and each getting to grips with some fascinating topic of how the galaxy is some way bound together by extraordinary forces. Yes, there is, for instance, the force of gravity, but gravity and space and time, according to Einstein, are strangely related and one. And Mr. Higgs, with his famous Higgs field, showed us how electricity and magnetism are, again, somehow bound together by a strange force. So, it seems a topic well worthy of study. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Stretch out, and you will find that this extraordinary brain fodder. And all you have to do is enjoy the free trial which can be had by clicking the link in the description, or, if you prefer, typing wondrium.com stroke Lindy Beige. Yes, that's stroke Lindy Beige. We never slash, you understand. You don't slash with a lightsaber. That would be barbarism. So I was on a stag at O.P. Horn, and an eagle landed in the tree, and I looked up and I startled him, and he flew off and dropped this fish. You can see the claw marks there. Holy shit. I definitely didn't catch him myself because the Russians would have shot me. So, yeah, gift from the gods. Great. <laughs> anyway, you got back from Kiev, mm -hmm. or Kiev, as, yes, the BBC got wants us, Kiev. as the BBC wants us to call it now. Uh, and the offensive started. Yeah, I got back and it was suddenly like we got back to our little quarters house in this village. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden it was like, right, pack your stuff, we're going. This is it. We're leaving. We are going somewhere. And they didn't really tell us what was happening. Mm -hmm. Like, they sort of told us, you're going on a different, to a different place. But, you know, we knew something that was up because there'd been, like, no armour in our area for, like, the last couple of months. And suddenly there's all these, like, tanks that are just, like, at certain times of the day, there's just be a load of armour, like, move down the road and hide in a, hide in a, in a hedge or something quickly. And it's like, something's happening. Mm. And there was a few weeks ago, they told us that there was like a hundred. The, the Russians had a small armored column on the other side of the river, and they might force the dam. So we were like, you know, thinking oh, oh, we're, Fire brigade we're about to get offensive. Yeah. And then you know they moved us to this holding area. Uh, they moved us to to some forest, which is the place where I thought we'd been nuked. Right. And. Um, Suddenly, you know, it's like right now we are we are going on the counteroffensive, and we we still thought we might be taken down south to go to curse on or something. You know what I mean? Mm. But no, it was Kharkiv, and suddenly we were we were part of it, and they split the my company of the legion, and some of us, uh, some of the guys were off doing infantry, normal infantry stuff. Mm. And uh, we were um, we were detailed to go and protect a battery of self-propelled artillery. Right. Uh, and went off doing that. And um, yeah, that's that's basically what happened. I mean, it was. Uh, I would say the. You know, I didn't go to this war for for thrills and and kicks, but there is something really spectacular. Uh, about being part of a massive combined arms offensive, you know, right. like columns of tanks heading down the road, all the guys on top of the vehicles cheering, artillery lined up in the hedgerows, absolutely shelling the hell out. For once, it's us doing the shelling, you know? Right. Not them, us, you know? Nothing's co very little's coming our way, but there's a lot going their way. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, fighter planes going overhead, our fighter planes hitting them. The, I mean, we got we got strafed by a fighter jet in the morning one time with rockets and stuff. And, and that was, yeah, there's... Um, but, and, and seeing the reaction of the Ukrainian public, mm -hmm. seeing how incredibly happy they were to be out from the boot of the Russians to... They, they had no power for months. Mm -hmm. The Russians hadn't... You know, the shops hadn't had anything in for months. They haven't been able to earn any money. It wasn't like the Russians all put them on the dole. 
Mm. And get, you know, well, well we, we've liberated you from Ukrainian fascists, but we're not going to allow you to, to work or to have any power or to have anything in the shops. I mean, if it wasn't for the Ukrainians having a culture of storing food, that, that a lot of them would have been in, in, in really bad trouble. They would have been starving to death, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just seeing, seeing a grateful populace genuinely happy to be liberated and being part of that, um, it, made, it made it all worth it. Right. And you, you actually set up a little clinic, didn't you? Oh, we, we, had a, we had a thing. We were in a village that we'd been told was pro-Russian. Right. And we were... One of the houses we were next to was this old babushka. So, you know, being a nice chap, we, we got, like... We had so many... We had, you know, so the ration situation went up in town and suddenly we're in a very... We've got so much food that I can't store it. It's, it's There's too much to go in the cupboards. Mm-hmm. So we thought, well, let's go and give some food to this babushka and chop a bit of firewood for it. But it, that was a smart move because she was like the grandmother or the great auntie of like a dozen guys in the village. Mm-hmm. And then they were like, well, what were the, sol- the soldiers were around her house and they all came to have a word. So like, what were these bloody soldiers doing at your house? These foreign soldiers who aren't Russians who we don't like. And then the, the, she was like, oh, no. She, in Ukraine, it was like, no, they're really nice young men. They brought me some fruit juice and they've helped me bring my firewood and they're, they're really good guys. And then suddenly these guys who before have been giving us, you know, some very cold stirs were like, oh, we, we brought you some milk. Oh, this is some cheese. My wife made it myself. And um, we started, like, leaving all our extra rations because, you know, the Ukrainians gave us some stuff like, like groats. Unhusked oats. Oh, right. Not going to eat them. Oh. But if you're a Ukrainian peasant, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's food. Yeah. So uh, possibly you can even just use them to plant oats. Uh, so we um, started leaving all our extra rations uh, before the church service on Sunday. We'd just go and leave it there. Mm-hmm. And then me and a US Marine um, guy, who I believe has sadly passed away now, um, he, uh, we started just running like a very basic clinic for them, because, you know, I'm not a doctor, but every time I've been the doctors, they've resolved most of my issues with cleaning a wound, mm-hmm. paracetamol, ibuprofen, aspirin, antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, there's antibiotics for when you've got, like, a, a sort of infected cut, and then there's antibiotics for when you've got, like, problems inside your stomach, and I know those two types. Right. So, in a total absence of... Because these... The, I don't want to use the word peasant in an insulting way, mm. but they're peasants. Mm. They live in a, in a subsistence kind of way, yep. you know. Their allotment is, is a major part of where they get their food from, and every house has a, a sizable vegetable garden, you know. Mm. And um, them getting to Kharkiv when they don't have a vehicle... While there's a war going on and there's all kind of checkpoints and stuff and restriction of movement was was impossible. Mm. So just being able to like go, yeah, okay, yeah, he's got a bit of an infected cup. Let's clean that up. Here's five days uh, amoxicillin, a couple of, you know, ibuprofen, crack on. And that that was the only medical care they could get. And no one asked us to do this. Me and the US Marine guy just decided to do it on our own. Mm. And it produced really good results. You know, the people there could actively see that we, we they started to speak to us because we had a polish guy who was helping us as well mm. and they were saying oh we're, we never expected this of you guys it's really nice what you're doing thank you oh i've been felt sick for ages and now I, I don't feel sick anymore and then they'd be like oh and then we were like what what how did the russians treat you in the year and then they went well they never did anything like this they never gave us anything the only thing they bought was vodka they stole everything else you know that's what they told us. So, yeah, you know, t- turning a bunch of people who basically were pro-Russian into like, you know what, actually, these lads are really nice. They're not stealing anything from us. They're helping us. Mm-hmm. And they don't indiscriminately shell our fucking village. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it was, right. So it wasn't that hard to turn them, you know. It only took a little bit of kindness and a little bit of resources. But um, it's one of the things I'm prouder of. Right. Um, help you know, help like hearts and minds. At the end of the day, you yeah. Know? So you you did the the hearts and minds side of uh, the the job of soldiering, and and as a Ford observer, you you did the military side of it. So were you in fact a model soldier at all times? Um, I I think overall, mo- some of my NCOs and commanders didn't like me. Some of them really liked me and thought mm-hmm. I was one of the best guys. Um, and I, I did work hard. Uh, 
But um, there was... Yeah, yeah I, I heard the bird coming. The, um, at the end of the Kharkiv, basically, we're with this artillery battery. And basically, victory in Kharkiv mm -hmm. has, has just been declared. You know, the Russians have gone. They're across the border. They're into Luhansk or they're back into Russia. Mm -hmm. They've gone. We've won. And the battery, the two of the guns from the battery had been out. And obviously during this time, the commander's been radioed and told, we've won. So the commander came back drunk. Now, you're not, you're not meant to drink at all mm -hmm. while you're a serving soldier. Mm -hmm. But, well, you know, this is Ukraine. And victory had just been declared. So the commander came back drunk. And then suddenly all the guys produced these bottles of brandy and vodka out of nowhere, you know. Mm -hmm. And we all sat to drinking. And it was a nice, the sun was out. It was a nice day, you know. Right. And then we're out the back of this, uh, this barn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, uh, and, you know, we're, we're drinking spirits. Do you know what I mean? And it's a hot day. And it's a hot day. So uh, everyone was very, very drunk. Right. And um, the uh, two of the guys were wrestling. And there's a guy, one of the guys, I, I'll call, well, his, his name was Ivan, but there's a 10,000 or 100,000 Ukrainians called Ivan. So I'm, okay. I'm not giving away his identity. Mm. But he's a great big lad. And he'd just beaten someone in wrestling. And I was, uh, you know, looking. And one of the guys was like, you fancy you go with Ivan? I'm like... Yeah, all right. So we set to wrestling, and I'm, I'm pretty strong. Mm -hmm. So I managed to get him on the ground and get his arm behind his back, and he's oh. like, he tapped, you know. He's like, okay, and I got up, and like, you know, fist bumped and that. Like it was all in good humour, but then at that moment, someone just jumped right round my neck, and I like, sort of went down and rolled. Mm -hmm. And at that time, at the same time, I felt something burning my head. So they jumped on me with a lit cigarette in the hand. And I don't know if they intended to burn me, but, but it stung. And then I got whoever this person was down mm -hmm. and, and, and had, had, their, like, had one of their arms twisted. And then at that moment, like, someone was like, oh, someone, I remember someone saying, like, Big Mac, let him go. So I let him go. And um, he punched me in the face with a lit cigarette still in his hand. So he punched me in the left eye with a lit cigarette. And I, at that moment, just went, boom, you know, and right. gave it, gave him a proper one, like, you, and then, you fucking prick, fucking punch me, I'll knock your teeth out. And uh, there's, well, there's a photo of this moment. Oh, right. And um, it then turned out that uh, the, the, the person I struck was, in fact, the battery commander. Oh. So I blacked a Ukrainian officer's eye. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in... You know, this is either a disgraceful thing or the finest traditions of the infantry. I'm right. not sure which. Uh, well, what were the consequences of this? Well, I was told I, I, I could have been kicked out of the Legion for that, but the officer himself had broken all of the rules. An officer should not compete with the men, strike the men, or drink, or be drunk. Definitely not be drunk in front of the men. Right. So he'd done all of those things, you know, and I, I just reacted. And I was struck first, so, you know, it's not my fault I punch a lot harder than him. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, but I was, uh, I was told that I was going to lose um, my combat pay for that. But then they didn't actually take it off me in the end. So that was so. I thought it, I thought that punch had cost me a few thousand euros, but it turns out it didn't. So worth it. It would have been worth it anyway. <laughs> right. uh, so yeah. Um, so that's it, really. Okay. So you took part in the successful offensive. Mm -hmm. Now you've um, you've left the Ukraine. You don't no plans to go back and rejoin the, the Legion. So not, what not, next? Not to rejoin the Legion. No. Um, I. Uh, as I mentioned before, I had to you know, deactivate a landmine while I was over there, and there was also... A... Uh, actually, I don't think you did tell us that. No. Okay, so, yeah, when we were... At, um, basically, I, I had to deactivate a landmine and a few hand grenade traps over there. The Russians like leaving things like that around. Mm -hmm. And it appears I'm steady enough to... It appears I am steady enough to deactivate uh, uh, traps and bombs without, without getting the trembles, you know? And um, 
I have decided, for, and then on my leave, I happened to meet someone who was working for a charity that's called Mine Action Group, mm -hmm. and they operate all over the world, um, South Sudan, Vietnam, places like that, places where there's landmines. Mm -hmm. And I have decided that I would like to make that my career. I would like to go into uh, demining and EOD, uh, explosive ordnance disposal, uh, type work and right. uh, yeah that's uh, what I plan to do with my future so uh, basically I, I kind of delayed my trip over there to come up and see you and make these videos so within a couple of days mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to Vietnam and I'm gonna start that process of learning to uh, to deactivate landmines and the different ways to do it mm -hmm. uh, and stuff and yeah make that my future basically and help the world and you know, help the world not get its feet blown off. Okay, thank you so much for coming in. It's you're been welcome. wonderful talking to you about this. You're a, you're a, a great storyteller. Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we all wish you all the best in, in Vietnam, making the world a bit safer. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lloyd. And from Lloyd and from me, good yes. night. <laughs> <laughs>